I'm sure. Wait. It says. Well, hello, everybody. <laughs> Hi there. So I'm popping in here for our second live stream for this week. One more to go, um, probably in the earlier morning tomorrow. But I've just been popping in here, sort of impromptu, responding to questions, thoughts, and feedback um, surrounding the promotion that we're doing right now on he my signature course, Healing Attachment Wounds, which is 82% off right now, and it will be until September 30th. So today, yesterday we talked a little bit about the four phases of the romantic journey, and today I wanted to talk a little bit more about the question that pops up fairly frequently in my online community, and that is, how do I know if this is love, right? So of course, there are lots of different types and forms and expression of love. You know, I think... Um, I think the 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 five love languages was a wonderful way to to sort of categorize and organize how we might express our love. But a question like this is usually asking more about, well, what is it that you are expressing in this way, right? How do I know that where it's coming from within you is the same place that it's coming from within me? And I think inevitably that becomes a conversation of breaking down your va values, expectations, and your priorities as well as what, what is the needs exchange between you. But it's, an, I think, also important to realize that so often our definition of what love means to us is very intricately tied up in what we value as a needs exchange. So the thing I would emphasize, however, though, is that love need not be tied up in a needs exchange. Um, and so a lot of times I think the, the conflict that we experience in relationships is determining you know, how closely can I tie these two things together with this person? So anecdotally speaking, this is a, probably not a very solidified um, concept I'm sharing here with you today. I think I decided to do this on a live stream because I'm interested to see how you receive it and what your thoughts and feelings are around it as this becomes more codified in my mind. Um, so I do want this to be kind of a, more of a discussion sort of live stream. Um, so if you're joining me right now, if you can type your name and where you're coming from in the chat box there, I'll definitely give you a shout out here on the call. And I do want to hear your thoughts and feedback on what it is I'm going to be discussing. So I want to talk about four types of love, um, at least four types that I have sort of observed. You could think of them. I don't think of them as hierarchical, although you might at times in your life experience them as hierarchical and perhaps they are cyclical as well, which is to say you might find yourself kind of going in an upward spiral with these types. Um, but this is just something I've noticed. So the first type I would say I'm going to call buddy love. So buddy love is a love that's kind of based on similar interests. You, you enjoy spending time together. You're respectful of one another. You, the relationship might even be experimental or exploratory on any number of levels. Um, it could be for the purposes of getting certain physical needs met, sexual needs met. Um, it could just be companionable. Um, there's typically not a whole lot of conflict in buddy love. It usually goes fairly smoothly. Um, and that's usually because the nature of this type of love is kind of circumstantial, right? You come together because of circumstances and you may break up because of circumstances, but there's not a whole lot of, um, let's say, conflict or fire around it. It feels like, yeah, that served its purpose and we have a mutual respect for one another. This is great. This was wonderful. Glad we could come together for this experience, right? And it usually will have kind of a natural conclusion and kind of end more or less amicably, right? So that's what I think of as buddy love. Um, then there's what another second type of love, which I think of as team spirit. <laughs> so team spirit is kind of like an upgrade from, from buddy love. So this is a type of love that does require a commitment of time, energy, and resources. Um, it's a love that's really more about how you want to structure your life, what you think your life should look like, and what provides you a sense of base security um, that is comfortable for you in your day-to-day -day routines. And this is as opposed to a spiritually intimate partnership, okay? Um, although it can over time involve, evolve in that direction, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. And so, 
You may have, I think people sometimes experience team spirit kind of love their whole lives. I've heard people say, well, th when this is your ideal type of relationship, typically you say, well, I want a partner. I want someone who's got my back and, you know, watches my six. I want someone that I can depend on to be there and blah, blah, blah. And of course, all of those things are natural to want in any type of love. But when you have a love that falls into the category of team spirit, that desire actually carries much more weight than other facets and other values that you might express in a relationship. So for example, passion or sexual fervor or um, you know, traveling and tasting the different zesty parts of life, you know, culture and all of that. It's not as important as sort of the, almost like a, a fraternal structure and, and experience of companionable connection you have in a team spirit love. It's like, it's like living your life with your best friend, okay? Um, so that's more like team spirit. And if the team spirit type of love reaches a point, and if it is, if it ends, or if it comes to some, um, let's say, rapid point in the relationship or rocky point in the relationship, it's usually because one partner, one or both, but usually it will be one um, first, is now starting to desire the next type of love, which is soul shaking love. Um, and so they're starting to become kind of bored or saturated with the tenets of team spirit type of love. Okay. And it can end, it can be kind of hard to end a team spirit kind of relationship because things may appear to be going well. And um, so it turns a bit contentious because it's going to lead to the dismantling of a structure that has provided basic security for both parties most of their t of the time. And so it will require a complete restructuring of your worldview as you navigate your contexts. And if you were not the one who wanted to move on from team spirit love, it's going to feel very much like an abandonment. And it's going, it, it is, it's going to feel like it wasn't your choice to have to step into a restructuring of the way you wanted to see and live, live your life. Um, and so if that happens, however, if this team spirit kind of comes crashing down, um, you are actually primed, whether you instigated it or not, to experience the next type of love, which is what I call soul shaking love in your next relationship. Now, if you refuse that, if you say, no, I just want to find another partner to fit to fit that those things that I still value and want and want to maintain in my life, which isn't right, wrong or, or anything else, it's just what the choice that you make, then it's likely that you will sooner than later find another partner to kind of fit that bill. Um, now, the next type of love I think of as soul shaking love, and this is usually the type of love that would bring people to a channel or a group like this. <laughs> um, and so it's a relationship which casts doubt on yourself and on your feelings. And you don't feel very sure of your footing anymore. The highs feel so amazing because through the other, you gain more access to parts of yourself. Okay. And in doing so, you also experience your own blocks to generating that feeling for yourself, which prevents the receiving and reciprocation of that feeling for someone else in a long term way, in a more secure, long term, consistent way. And so, you're kind of left feeling confused about what is real because what you experience and know of your reality in a soul shaking love is actually being called into question. That's why it's called soul shaking, right? And so it presents this really amazing opportunity to move into the next level of love, which I think of as ascended love, whether together or with a subsequent partner. So you might find a partner in soul shaking love whose sole function was to jettison you into understanding how to access the, those parts of yourself for yourself so that you can step into another type of love. Or it may be that with this person, you both are able to reconstruct your own perceptions of yourself and call up those parts that your partner is stimulating within you so that you yourself can remove those blocks and more fully step into your circumference in that way. If, however, we cling too tightly to the ego and we think that it has to look and sound and feel this way and I I don't need to change this is just them them not behaving in the way they should be 
then you may fall back into and retreat to some of the con the conventions of team spirit or buddy love because it just feels safer. Okay. Now let's say that you decide that or you go through this process of soul shaking love and let's say you decide you do want or you do in your and or you just experience a new level of connection with yourself, then it's likely that you're going to step into an ascended type of love. Ascended love is a type of love where the, the goal is not about soul growth anymore so much as it is about um, like like project building. Like, um, so when you are in soul shaking love, it's like you sort of antagonize each other to the point where you are forced to kind of grow and expand beyond what you originally thought you could. And then once you are grown and expanded, now the energy doesn't have to bounce back and forth between you anymore. Now you are feeding this thing between you and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And now this thing isn't stuck in this sort of linear path. Now it can you know, move up and around and in three dimensions and things like that. So, so ascended love is really more about the love that you experience with someone becomes so much bigger than the love that you would need to generate within yourself alone. And it usually takes on the form, some form of generativity that you are now connected to and giving back to the collective experience in some fashion. Right. Um, so there's a, a quality of service to ascended partnership. Um, but usually it's because both partners have a sense of purposefulness that expresses itself through the vehicle of the relationship that evolves between you. Um, and so in ascended love, you would start coming up with new definitions for what passion actually is and for what that means to you in the context of partnership. So it's it's it differs than than buddy love because it's um, it's sort of the experience of being able to now now in this case you can actually release some of your boundaries and merge into one another because you have developed them to such a point to where you know if you release them you quite easily can move back into your space right so if on a spiritual and energetic level you merge into one another you have complete faith and understanding that you now will also be able to cut to come back out, right? Find your way back to yourself. So, so you are starting to master expansion and contraction, right? And you can master that kind of energy between each other. And that becomes a microcosm of how you are starting to master the expansion and contraction of energy within your life, just as a whole. And that impacts your sense of purposefulness in every facet of your life, in every aspect of what you do. Right. So your romantic relationship actually becomes an extension of a dynamic expression of who you are and what it is that you are here on this planet to accomplish. So that's how I think of ascended love. Um, so I wanted to share those four types of love with you. Buddy love, team spirit, soul shaking love and ascended love. Um, and I would love to know in the chat box there or in the comments if any of those resonate with you. And also, have I missed any? Are there any types of love that you've witnessed or experienced that um, could be added to this list? I didn't touch upon like platonic forms of love because I think there's lots of different types of love like that. And obviously, there's family types of love, parental love. Um, I was focusing primarily on in the realms of romantic uh, relationship. But if there's other types of love you think I should include, I'd love to see that there too. We have Lizette. Hi, Lizette from Orlando. We have Jay from Michigan. We have Adam from Chicago. Hello. We have uh, Rebecca from Port, I think that's Landia. Welcome. We have Geronimo. We have uh, Mott John. We have uh, Christopher, Christopher Cosinano. Welcome. Thank you all for joining me here today. Uh, we have questions. How do I fall back in love with my female partner as a man? Well, that's a deep question, and there definitely wouldn't be a blanket answer to that. Um, although, you know, if you think about it, how do I fall back in love? Well, you would also want to think about what it is that drew you to them in the first place. What was it that how did they how did you feel in their presence what did you admire and respect about them to begin with and why is it that you feel now that you've become saturated and is it that you're not passionately in love you don't love them at all you feel completely turned off by them there's so many questions that i would have and follow up to that question 
Um, but, you know, I think too, sometimes it's important to realize that we have a tendency to attribute attraction and arousal to external stimuli, when in fact, attraction and arousal is an internal response, right? So that means that that we can access our own arousal, that we can tap into that energy, and that is actually not so dependent on the people in our external circumstances. Now, I think there are occasions in life where people meet and they come together to serve a certain function and or purpose. And as, as much as you can be in touch with whatever your internal systems are for attraction, then that will help you become more discerning towards this idea that, Am I just responding to external stimuli or is this a discerning critical catalytic turning point in my life where whatever the soul lesson is here has has realized itself and it may be time for the love that we experienced to evolve into something else, right? I will add to that, however, the Kinsey Institute found, if you're talking about sexual attraction, that sometimes if you open a relationship, that for male partners specifically, if a male partner starts having sex with another woman, his attraction to his wife actually comes back. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm not proposing that you have affairs or whatever else or however you define that, but there is some research out there that suggests that switching up the way that you approach sex and the way that you think about attraction may actually reignite that fire. Um, I'd also recommend checking out uh, Jaya's Five Erotic Blueprints. Just Google Five Erotic Blueprints, and she has some recommendations along those lines. Um, ascended love equals self-love. I would argue self-love is required in every single one of these love types. Um, I do, it would require self-love because you cannot, I actually don't believe that there's all different types of love, right? And there's love where, and particularly in soul shaking love, when, when, when you are feeling so shook up, it's usually because you are recognizing in the other an aspect of yourself that's asking for expression. And it's easier for you to access that through the channel of the other person because they are you are holding them as a focus they are sort of serving as a point of focus for you to access that part of you right now the challenge then becomes oh this person makes me feel xyz and that's an amazing feeling and how can i start to um you know how can i start to hold on to that and integrate it into my felt experience and know and understand that part of myself because now they are sort of gifting that back to you in a way. And as they try to gift it back to you, if you start to feel a conflict or if you start to feel um, something, a resistance, let's say, to that type of contrast, then, then what's being gifted back to you is the understanding that you have some kind of energetic block to receiving receiving is, I have to tell you, I think oftentimes receiving is the biggest issue everyone's dealing with as opposed to giving. Um, and because once you learn how to receive, then giving is not so difficult, actually. And, and even people who are over givers, they suck at receiving. So it's not, so they're, you know, it's like, so you can be an overgiver, but if you're not receiving, you're not actually giving from a place of abundance. You're giving from a place of scarcity and lack. And that turns into uh, a he said, she said situation, right? It becomes a scorecard above the relationship. And the, at the basis of that is actually an inability to take in, right? And then we think it's someone else's fault that we don't have an ability to take in. So we give more and more and more until we feel even more depleted. And then we're like, but I gave so much. Why can't they give it back? Yet you couldn't take it in even if you wanted to. So it becomes a snake that eats its own tail. Right? No, I don't need that. I'm fine. Oh, no, it's fine. Whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I don't know. No, I don't. I'm good. I'm good. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. And you're not taking anything in. You're not taking anything in. Should, you should co-author a book with Lisa Romano. I don't know who that is, but I'm intrigued. I am writing my own book right now, actually. I'm, I went to Mexico in July to write the first portion of it. I'm going back next month to write another portion of it. It's going to be a fun process. Um, Paulette from California. Welcome. Craig from Australia. Hi there. Um, 
We have Umana from South Africa. Hi. Oh, good. I'm glad that helped, Geronimo. Jess from Kentucky. I feel like we flow between the types of love in our relationship as we learn and grow, depending on what is going on inside of us and in our relationship. Yes, I think that's a wonderful observation. I elect to remain uh, exclusive to her, but important info for sure. Yes. So I would definitely recommend looking at um, Jaya's Erotic Blueprints. I'd also recommend um, looking at a book called The Way of the Superior Man. I don't agree with everything he says, but I think from a male perspective, it was probably would be a helpful book, particularly if you are a heterosexual cisgendered man. Um, you might also think about looking at John Gray's Conscious Men. It's a recent book that he came out with called Conscious Men. He talks about these dimensions. Um, four types again. So the four types would be buddy love, team spirit, um, soul shaking love and ascended love. So buddy love is kind of a circumstantial experience where you find where you're companionable with one another, you have fun, maybe you explore a little bit. This is kind of like, you know, summer camp relationship or like first relationship you had freshman year of college, or you do a foreign exchange and you had a relationship while you were there and it, it had a, a shelf life and you came back and it wasn't like there was, you know, it just was life. That's what happens. Um, or maybe you both just ha got out of a long-term relationship and you meet and you have a lot of fun together. You go out, you drink together, you do different things. It's really companionable. Maybe you have sex, maybe you don't, you, just, you, you know, you just enjoy each other's company because you're sort of holding each other during a transitory experience. Then maybe one of you meets someone and gets lit up by the next person and you tell them I've met someone and blah, 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 and I want to pursue it. And it's like, oh, well, I guess the fun has ended, but I feel you, you know, I, I hope it works out for you. Like it's very friendly, buddy, buddy, companionable, right? Then there's the team spirit one, just to summarize, team spirit is, team spirit tends to be more of why a lot of us get married, particularly if we get married when we're in our 20s, we're looking for to establish base security, right? We're looking to establish the structure in which we conceive of and understand the way life's supposed to be right? And it's a needs exchange. It's about, do we have the same values? Do we have the same priorities? Does it make sense? Do we go to the same church? Do we, you know, do we still want the same, do we want to live in the same town? It's a very like um, brass tacks, like, is this, and, and, and it, nothing wrong with that. I am no, by no means belittling that at all. That is a very important type of foundational experience. Um, and it can evolve into other types, the other two types of love, two types of love, which I, which I call soul shaking, soul shaking love, and or um, ascended love. So, so usually, if not all the time, but sometimes, if you're in the team spirit, eventually one partner or both, but usually one will get there before the other, starts kind of reaches a point where they're like, okay, so we've built this life together. Now what? And I feel I don't like the things that connected us before don't feel like they're connecting us anymore. And I'm wondering if there are more depths here and I'm wanting more depth here. And is that possible, you know, with you and for the other partner, it might feel like, what are you talking about? <laughs> the partner might be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Where everything's just fine. Why are you trying to make problems where there are no problems to be had? And so, so it, it, that's why I say it's soul shaking because one person may be like looking for something and it sort of like catalyzes the relationship in one direction or the other. And, you know, you may each have your path with that. It doesn't always happen. Sometimes you both stay in team spirit for the rest of your life and you have a wonderful, loving relationship. And that is the experience that you're here on this earth to explore. But sometimes one person shakes things up or both of you kind of reach that point and but usually there's one partner who's like, hey, look, we've reached this point. You're not acknowledging it, but I know you're there too. Let's like address this. And then you may end up there. Um, so ascended love is basically the result of how you choose to integrate that experience if it is one that you have. Buddy love to team spirit to soul shaking love to ascended love. So you could think of it as a hierarchical kind of trajectory, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be. I think that it could also just be the experience that someone is here to have. And I, 
I don't think that romantic love necessarily needs to be the focus for every human being on this earth. Some people get that figured out right away and their life is about some other, something else. Like their learning and their conflicts and the things that they're working with isn't about romantic connection. Like that's figured out. It's about like, maybe they become um, really good with kids and like their, their work is about creating a new and fantastic curriculum for teaching children, you know, how to read well, or maybe um, they have a fantastic relationship, a secure relationship, and and their purpose here is to help the sick and the elderly, right? And they develop wonderful programs and build things around that, you know? So, but I do think for some of us, relationships and romantic love becomes the focus of why we're here. And so we experience that kind of turmoil because there is a growth and an expansion that happens in that space, um, which is specific to, you know, what we're talking about here. Um, okay. You are brilliant and so well-spoken. I've had many friends following you that I referred and you, you and attached helped us begin changing our lives. Oh, thank you. That's so nice to hear. Um, how do we know when we're ready for ascended love? I don't know if it's a matter of being ready I think it just happens kind of like um, yesterday we talked about the four phases of love and how you go from discovering to loving and that it's a transition that happens kind of like the way the sun warms the room. You know, you, you were in a cold room and all of a sudden you feel warm and you don't really remember and or know how that happened, but it did over time. And so the, even the notion of readiness is actually in contradiction to what you would experience in ascended love, which is, sort of a complete acceptance and a sinking into wherever you are in the moment, however you are in this moment. And it's not, there's no, there's no level of readiness that you could accomplish. It's just like an unfolding and relaxing into yourself and an acceptance that whatever is going on in your life, including any contrast you may be experiencing is precisely where you are meant to be and and what you are meant to be experiencing because there are gifts in every second of your experience if that makes any sense um lisa romano is a youtube and author discussing exactly how insecure attachment styles create specifically in the environment of chemically dependent narcissistic parents well i kind of stay away from that um only because i don't like to talk about labels in that way i feel like i feel like it's helpful in that we can categorize things so that we start to draw lines around things and that allows us to kind of create boundaries in a sense. But once we move beyond that point, I actually think we need to dispel with the labels because it actually becomes, if we cling to it too tightly, um, a barrier to getting to where it is that you need to be. Um, so, but that's interesting. Um, thought provoking perspectives. I'm glad you think so, Kenzie. Well, we are kind of getting to the end of our, our little blurb here. So I just, as a reminder, um, this live stream we did yesterday and today and probably tomorrow morning is in promotion of a course, my signature course called Healing Attachment Wounds, which is on promotion right now for 82% off. You can check it out in the link in the caption of this video. Um, it's seven lessons that I recommend you do over the course of seven weeks to help take you from feeling lost and confused in your relationships to stepping into what I call yourself sovereignty. So you can experience the type of love that you want <laughs> for wherever you are in your process. Um, and ideally doing it without having to talk in circles around your feelings or even for hours or even years on end with no tangible result, because we use cognitive reframing, body activation, and arts-based experientials to help you start to take all the insight that you have and bring it down into the body so that you actually feel differently. Because so often I feel like individuals um, who are on my channel and or in my group, they get their problems, they understand it, they've read the books, they know, they know, they look at the patterns, they understand, but the struggling with actually feeling differently, the struggling with attaching this, attracting the same type of partners or being attracted to the same type of partners. They're struggling with cyclical dialogues with their partners that they can't seem to get out of. They keep triggering each other. And so that kind of experience is what we're trying to get at with this course in Healing Attachment Wounds by shifting the focus and the energetic momentum from, there's a problem here and we gotta fix it, right? So shifting the energy and the momentum from problem fixing 
to moving into a place of creativity and relaxation and what do I love about this person and moving into a place that's much more fun and playful and easeful because I believe that in adulthood, I believe that in adulthood, particularly when we have powerful attachment relationships like this, we are giving ourselves permission to love in the way that children do. So in adulthood, in our attachment relationships, we are giving ourselves permission to love in the way that children do. And so we need to treat them with kindness, the relationships and ourselves and our partners with kindness and gentleness and playfulness and fun, right? Because that is how you want to raise a healthy child. <laughs> and like a child, we will find ourselves tantruming in relationships and we'll find ourselves wanting to beat the other person with our toy, <laughs> right? Or we'll find ourselves wanting to cry and run away and go hide in our room. But you know, all of that is an, is an okay and a welcomed part of the process. And if we can learn to connect with one another and, and assume a less serious and the world is ending attitude towards these things, which are a natural expression of how we feel and what we would allow for children to have, but we don't allow for ourselves to have, then our relationships could actually be a much more pleasurable playground to, to explore, right? And so that's the approach that I take in my course healing attachment wounds, but as well in any of the courses that I offer. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, again, I'm offering it this month at 82% off. There's a link to that in the caption of the video with a bunch of video tutorials from people who have taken the course before um, and things like that. So if you wanna learn more, you can check it out. It's uh, The offer is until September 30th. Um, so thank you for joining me here today. We have one more question. When we're securely attached, is that what frees us up to focus on other aspects of life and thrive? Precisely. Yes. Because when you're securely attached, you're not con overly concerned with survival fears anymore, right? Now you can start worrying about other things. Um, great as always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for joining me here today. Um, and I will be back tomorrow, probably earlier in the day. So bye.